Hello, welcome to another Facebook Live from the Omega Quant headquarters in South Dakota, where we are in the polar vortex or about to be. So it's awful outside, but <clears throat> we still have power, so it's warm inside. And we're going to talk about some research today that we just published um, a week ago, I think, in um, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and essential fatty acids. So this paper is the Association of Reported Fish Intake and supplementation status with the omega-3 index. I'm Christina Jackson. I'm the first author on this paper. I'm also the daughter of Bill Harris, who is the last author on this paper, and my boss, um, and my dad. So we, <laughs> we wrote this paper together, and, um, um, and we're just going to share some findings and uh, just give some context to why we did it and what we think it's useful for. Right. So why don't you just um, summarize the, the basic design and findings of the study? Mm -hmm. So this is a pretty simple study. It was a large observational study, basically, where we um, had about 3,500 people where we knew their omega-3 index, which is um, a blood level of, of, of omega-3s, EPA, and DHA. So those are the long-chain omega-3s found mostly in seafood and associated with seafood. Um, <clears throat> we can measure that in the blood, and that's what we do at Omega Quant primarily because it's also related to health. So we had the Omega-3 index, about 3,500 people. We also asked them about how much fish they ate and whether or not they took Omega-3 EPA and DHA supplements. Mm -hmm. How did we get their blood? What was... We, so this is a population because we're a commercial and a research lab um, at OmegaQuant. We have access, we have people who will order um, tests directly from us if they're interested in finding out their omega-3 index level. We also work <clears> with, um, go to trade shows and work with companies that want to test test levels on people um, for whatever reason. And so we have thousands of people that we test every year. And this is a dry and this blood is spot. A, from a dried blood spot. So we are able to, um, you don't have to go to a lab to get your blood drawn for this. So it's just much easier to um, get this information from, from everyday people um, without having to go through a hospital or a lab. You can just prick your finger, <clears throat> put it on a filter paper, and we can analyze the, the omega-3 levels in that drop of blood. So it's kind of a unique population because it's uh, we had we it's more accessible to a lot more people, so we were able to um, get a lot of people to take the test who may or may not have be involved in a research study where you'd have to go in and have a bunch of labs drawn. Um, so we had we also it's also kind of unique because these might be people who are more interested in omega threes in eating omega threes and knowing their levels. Um, so we had kind of, we have a bigger spread. In, in reported intake of omega-3s than we think um, maybe a general, more representative U.S. population would be. Um, and that helps with us being able to see patterns. <clears throat> so what was the question you were asking? We wanted to know what the omega-3 index level was um, in people who reported eating um, fish different for di at different frequencies and taking taking omega-3 supplements. We wanted to know how, um, what people reported uh, eating omega-3s, how their blood levels matched up to what they reported. And well, the results. So so let's I look at the main. I'll, I'll go under. Yes. The main, <clears throat> the main findings are basically summed up in this chart. And this is, on the bottom, we have our different amounts of fish intake. So we asked people, how often do you eat tuna or other non-fried fish? And their options were none per week, every other week, every week, two times a week, and three times per week. And then we asked them, do you take an omega-3 supplement? Yes or no. And then the only follow-up we had with that was what kind. So it was either a fish oil, krill oil, algal oil, or a flaxseed oil. And for this data, we only used, or we, we didn't include the flaxseed oil um, group because that is not a source of EPA and DHA. It's a, short, a source of ALA, a shorter chain omega-3. And when we looked at that group, it wasn't, um, it was different than the other supplement groups. So we see, as we would hope and expect, a really nice dose response between what people reported eating 
and their, um, their blood levels of omega-3s. So we have at the lowest, not eating any fish or taking a supplement. The blue bars are not people who didn't take supplements. The red bars are people who did take supplements or reported taking. So at the very lowest, um, lowest intake group, we have an average omega-3 index of about 4%. 4 and that's um, pretty typical uh, omega-3 index of, um, of an American from what we've seen. Um, for and then as you go up in reported fish intake, uh, you can see there's an increase in the omega-3 index. So the more omega-3s you eat, the more they show up in your blood. The supplement group on average had the same pattern with fish intake, but they were on average about two percentage points higher um, in their omega-3 index, which makes sense because they're taking a potent source of EPA and DHA. So again, dose is is a big factor in the omega-3 index. And that's great because then we know we can do something about it. So, so what did you find? What was the, what group got the best omega-3 levels? The best <clears throat> omega-3 levels, not surprisingly, occurred in the group that ate the most fish and took a supplement. So three or more times a week they ate fish, report eating fish, and they took a supplement. And that got the average of that group just above 8%. So. 8% is this line, and that's been our target for um, heart health um, for a long time based on lots of research that we talk about. Um, having a blood level omega-3 index of 8% is associated with lower risk of heart disease, and so that's really what we wanted to see here, here is what does it take to get to 8%. Um, and for, here, for this group, it was the average reached above 8%. But eating three fish three or more times a week still got you into about the seven percent range, um, and so that's still very that's a very good level to be at. Um, and what the other thing to note is that the standard deviation bars um, show about two thirds of each of these um, populations in each category. So two thirds of the people in this category were had um, omega three index between this range. So we had people much higher. Than 8%, and across the board, we had people above 8% um, in at least the supplementation groups, regardless of uh, their fish intake. So that really also brings us to the point of um, individual variability. And so while we see this beautiful relationship that on average we see increases in the omega 3 index. Um, as you go up an intake for an individual, it doesn't mean that we can say, if you just eat fish three times a week and take any supplement, you will definitely get to 8%. It's um, more, it has to be more individualized than that, essentially, because um, that didn't work for everybody. Not everybody hit that 8% in that group. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, what kind of limitations for this, this study, study, you know, what can't, what can you <clears throat> not conclude from this study? So this is a um, observational study. This is a correlation study, so we can't um, talk about causation, which we are really interested in. Um, we have um, a limitation of these are reported intakes. We have no way to know exactly if people were eating or taking supplements um, at the rates that they reported but that's just generally an issue with all dietary intake data. Um, we didn't give people uh, three servings of fish a week and a supplement and measured their levels um, in, that, in a direct intervention. Mm -hmm. So we can't really um, say that. We can basically just say these are the relationships and it's more likely that if you eat more EPA and DHA from fish and or supplements, you will have higher blood levels. Why didn't you ask them how much EPA and DHA they were taking in the, the supplement groups? Yes, that is a great question that we get asked a lot. So I think the first reason why we didn't ask is because these are uh, questionnaires that we include with our kits that go out to consumers. And our main goal is to get a vague idea of uh, what people are eating and taking as a supplement. So we wanted to keep the questions um, research-based but as simple to answer as possible so people didn't get overwhelmed or confused by the questions um, and so they'd actually answer it. The second 
reason um, is another kind of a consumer behavior issue potentially um, where it's hard to know the difference between what you're taking in a, in a supplement especially um, the difference between the amount of fish oil you're taking and the difference between and the amount of EPA and DHA that you're taking so, so you, you might get confused you might get wrong data exactly so mm -hmm. you might say um, oh I take a fish oil supplement it says <clears> it's a thousand milligrams so that's what I'm going to write down, well, you're actually only maybe getting 300 milligrams of EPA and DHA, but we wouldn't know what one you meant, essentially. And so you could just get data all over the place um, with that kind of confusion. So uh, until that is clearer um, to consumers, we would rather uh, not collect data that's potentially full of errors and then also might discourage people from answering the question. Yeah. Um, and the, the simple yes, no, do you take a supplement um, still did a pretty good job of mm -hmm. estimating, of um, relating to, to, in, to the omega-3 index. So do you have to take a supplement to get an omega-3 index of eight? No, you can absolutely do it through fish alone. It's um, really just the dose of EPA and DHA you're taking, which can come from food, mm -hmm. primarily fish, and, and or supplements. So okay. it's really about that nutrient. Um, and taking eating it through fish is often more um, bioavailable. You're eating a bigger dose usually at one time, um, and you're eating it with fat and food. Mm -hmm. With supplements, some of them, if you don't eat them with food, you don't absorb them as well, potentially. Um, so, and there's a lot of other great things about fish. <laughs> Are there but, any populations that just... Yes. So we often look to uh, populations that traditionally have very high fish diets. Um, Japan is kind of the classic example, and they eat fish at <clears> least <throat> three or more times a week. Um, and their average omega-3 index is about 8% or 8 or 9% on um, just from their diets. They don't need to supplement. Yeah. So... Uh, yes. Well, let me ask you one other question. There is um, recently American Heart Association uh, came up with uh, new fish intake guidelines for heart disease. Mm -hmm. uh, how do those intakes compare to what we find? Yes. So the new um, American Heart Association guidelines say one to two servings of seafood a week for the general population to uh, promote heart health. And so we from our from our data, we see that um, eating fish twice a week without a supplement gets you to around five five and a half percent, um, which is on average, which is fairly short of the eight percent. So um, I guess the expectation that um, that recommendation would get you to a blood level that is uh, eight percent cardioprotective uh, that that doesn't really match up. In the data, um, so just make that that expectation needs to kind of be set that these recommendations are not based on getting you to a certain blood level. Yeah. And we think maybe they should be, but um, that that's just the way it is yeah. at this point. So, so, so what do you say to people who say, "I'm taking a supplement, I'm good." Um, supplements can have all kinds of different. You have to know exactly what you're taking. So, kind of the bottom line of of this whole thing is that making good choices on your, about um, the supplements you're taking, understanding how much EPA and DHA um, you're actually getting in those supplements is very important. Um, being consistent with it is also mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. You might have a supplements you bought and they're in your, your uh, cabinet and you haven't taken them for months, but you did at one point, your levels are not going to stay high if you don't continue to take EPA and DHA or eat fish. Um, consistently. So basically knowing what's in your supplements, if you take supplements and picking the right fish. So picking fish that are high in EPA and DHA, not all fish are um, typically fish that are from, um, we call them oily fish. And um, they're usually from colder waters or higher in EPA and DHA. Typically the other important thing with fish is to understand what fish are more likely to have higher levels of mercury or other toxins um, and making sure that you make the right choices um, it, with regards to that so that when you're eating what fish more and more meat? fish uh, that are high, high in toxins, mercury. we have the tile fish from the Gulf of Mexico, I believe, 
Um, is it a king mackerel? Not all mackerel, but king mackerel. Swordfish. Um, swordfish and shark. Pretty much it. I think that's it. Those, um, are, high, the those are the really high uh, fish that have really high mercury. And often it's the big predator fish that yeah. um, end up living a long time, eating a lot of other fish, and accumulating really high levels yeah. of these toxins. The, the, um, the salmon, for example. Salmon is very common and has very low levels of these toxins in general. Um, and there are lots of uh, websites where you can go recommendations for fish based on their EP and DHA levels and also their toxin levels um, on average, essentially. Um, but basically being more informed about your supplements and your fish is really important to improving your omega-3 index. So what's your take home message from this paper for consumers? Um, if, if you think you're eating enough omega-3s through your diet and supplementation, you likely are not <laughs> to reach a good blood level in the US. Um, I think it's just because our standard uh, intake is so low, we have um, just kind of steadily taken fish out of the diet, seems like for so long that eating two time fish twice a week just seems foreign to a lot of people. So how, how much so, omega-3 would you, if you've got an omega-3 index of 4% mm -hmm. baseline, how much omega-3 would you probably have to eat to get to about 8%? You'd probably need to get about at least 1,500 milligrams of EPA and DHA a day, yeah. um, which you can do just through supplements or you can do through a mix. But, um, and that, if you did it through just fish, you're talking three or more times a week of mm -hmm. fish for sure and a, and a the right choice right so well, it's fairly high any uh questions people feel free to um send uh, we have one question from mike here you can answer it right now mm -hmm. uh does this test the omega-3 index test tell the average over a few days or just at that moment it really is a good marker of about the last three or four months um, of your omega-3 status because mm -hmm. it's just it's essentially measured in red blood cells which don't uh, we get all replaced until four months. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a good long-term exposure marker. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, and the other question was about mercury and toxins in fish. Um, and that's it's something that you need to be aware of when you are deciding to consume a lot more fish or if you're pregnant or lactating, it's something um, you can make the right decisions. A lot of the fish that we typically eat are lower um, on average in these in mercury and toxins, but being an educated consumer is great is what you need to do hope this was helpful uh, if, again if you have questions uh, post them back to us we'll try to respond thanks very much thank you okay